<laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> In the liturgy, after addressing God in praise and thanksgiving, we add the words, may our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. After confessing our sins and asking God for forgiveness, we add the words, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. After addressing our supplications to God, we add the words, hear our prayer, O Lord. Having addressed God on the assumption that God is listening, we then ask God to hear favorably our praise, our thanksgiving, our plea for forgiveness, our supplications. The question I'd like to consider in this lecture is then, what is the understanding of God implicit in this repeated liturgical action of asking God to hear favorably our address to God? In asking God to hear our address favorably, we are presumably taking for granted that God can respond to our sacrifice and praise and thanksgiving by accepting it. That God can respond to our plea for forgiveness by offering forgiveness. And that God can respond to our supplications by granting what we ask. <laughs> the understanding of God implicit in these liturgical actions is apparently then that God can respond to our address. Once that is noted, however, Maimonides style worries immediately arise in the mind of anybody versed in the tradition of philosophical theology. Can God really respond, literally speaking? Is it not incompatible with God's aseity, with God's eternity, and with God's immutability to respond to what we say? Do we not need an alternative Maimonides style analysis of what we are doing at this point in the liturgy? an analysis that does not presuppose that, literally speaking, or even by analogical extension, God can respond. And as for our supplications, we are evidently taking for granted that God can respond by intervening in the causal order. But can God really intervene in the causal order, literally speaking? And if God can intervene, is there any reason to suppose that God does? Much of what we intercede with God to do never happens. Do we not, at this point also, need a skeptical Maimonides-style analysis of the liturgy? <laughs> to plunge immediately into one or another of those much-vexed questions from the tradition of philosophical theology would be to assume that we know the significance of asking God to hear our address favorably. But do we? Rather than just assuming that we know the significance of this added on address to God, I propose that we stand back and reflect on its significance. Why don't we voice our praise, our thanksgiving, our plea for forgiveness, our supplications, and let it go at that? Why do we add the plea that God hear favorably what we have said? As I noted in a previous lecture, the church did not just come up with this addition. In appending this addition to its praise, its thanksgiving, its plea for forgiveness, its supplications, the church has followed the lead of the psalmist. Over and over, dozens of times and multiple variations, the psalmist asks for God's favorable hearing. Hear my prayer, incline your ear, hasten to answer me, hear my voice, hear my words, Answer me, give here to my cry. Just a few examples from the Psalms. <laughs> Some of the significance of the addition is obvious. God's invitation to address him does not carry the implication that we can now just take for granted that God will hear favorably whatever we say. We remember the declaration of the prophets that God will not so much as listen, let alone hear favorably. Maybe the <laughs> the praise addressed to him by those whose daily lives are rife with injustice. And we know that our plea for God's forgiveness will fall on deaf ears if we ourselves return, refuse to forgive our fellows. But even those who seek to love God above all and their neighbors as themselves, recognize that God's hearing favorably what they say is a free act of grace and favor on God's part. It's not something that our address exacts from God. It's not something that God must do. Our prayer that God will hear favorably our address 
is our acknowledgement that it is an act of free grace on God's part to hear favorably what we have said. I take that much to be clear. But what exactly is it that we are asking God graciously to do? Take, for example, our supplications. Are we just singling out some things that we would like to happen and asking God to intervene in the causal order and bring them about? Doing this on the off chance that God will bring about at least some of what we ask. Do we pray for the healing of friends, relatives, and fellow congregants? And then, if healing occurs, conclude that God heard favorably in this case. Whereas, if healing did not occur, conclude that for reasons hidden from us, God did not hear favorably. If that's what we're doing, namely singling out various things that we would like to happen, on the off chance that God will bring about some of them if we ask God to do so, what is the appropriate mood or stance on our part? Is the appropriate stance hope? Do we pray in the hope that from all the supplications addressed to him, God will select ours for favorable hearing? Or is the appropriate stance perhaps wish? Are we expressing the wish that God will select our request from the, among all the others for favorable hearing? Or is the appropriate stance sometimes at least desperation? Do we sometimes imitate the psalmist when he cries out in desperation, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Or do we, as scripture sometimes suggests, pray with confidence? Confidence in what? So once again, what are we, what are we asking God to do when we ask God to hear favorably our address to God? How are we to understand this liturgical act? In all traditional liturgies, among the prayers that the people offer to God is the Lord's Prayer. That this is not just one among others is indicated by the fact that it's introduced by words indicating that this is the prayer our Lord presented when he was asked by one of his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. In the Episcopal liturgy, for example, the celebrant says, and now, as our Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to say, in short, this for the church is the paradigmatic prayer. All other prayers in the liturgy are to be understood as variations on or amplifications of this prayer. Or if some prayer cannot be understood that way, then it has no place in the liturgy, or to speak more cautiously, then its place in the liturgy will have to be defended on some other ground than that in praying this particular prayer we are praying as our Lord taught us. <laughs> After the opening address, our Father in heaven, and the first petition, that God's name be hallowed, we pray, your kingdom come. We then ask that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that God give us this day our daily bread, that God forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and that God deliver us from the time of trial and from the grip of evil. And we then conclude our petitions with the words, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. I think the basic question to ask concerning that paradigmatic prayer is how we are to understand the role in the prayer as a whole of the petition that God's kingdom come. And the echo of that petition in the closing declaration that the kingdom is God's. Are we to understand this petition as just one among others? On a level, for example, with the petition that God give us this day our daily bread? I think that would be a serious misinterpretation. It's my judgment that the prayer as a whole is to be understood as framed by the petition that God's kingdom come and by the closing declaration that the kingdom is God's. I judge that the other petitions are to be understood as occurring within that frame. We offer these prayers in the conviction that the kingdom is God's. In that conviction, we pray for the coming of God's kingdom, that is, for its ever fuller manifestation, 
In God's kingdom, God's name will be hallowed. Hence it is that we pray, hallowed be your name. In God's kingdom, God's will shall be done. That's why we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In God's kingdom, we will enjoy sustenance sufficient for our daily lives. Hence it is that we pray, give us this day our daily bread. In God's kingdom, God will forgive us our debts, and we will forgive those in debt to us. Hence it is that we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In God's kingdom, we will no longer be faced with trials and will be released from the grip of evil. Hence it is that we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In short, within the frame constituted by our declaration that the kingdom is God's and by our prayer for its ever fuller manifestation, we mention signs of the kingdom and pray for the presence of those signs. When the kingdom is fully manifested, God's name will be hallowed. God's will shall be done. We will have sustenance sufficient for our daily lives. We will be forgiven even as we forgive. We will no longer be faced with trials and we will be released from the grip of evil. To mention these signs of the kingdom is of course at the same time to allude to ways in which God's kingdom is not yet fully manifested. God's name is not universally hallowed. hallowed. Not everybody has sustenance sufficient for their daily lives. Many practice vengeance rather than forgiveness. Many remain in the grip of one and another form of evil, in the grip of addictions, ideological isms, and the like. Given that this is the paradigmatic prayer, and given that in this prayer our petitions are set in the context of declaring that the kingdom is God's and of petitioning God for the full manifestation of God's kingdom, the conclusion surely is that our prayers in general are not to consist of and are not to be understood as consisting of asking for God, asking God for things in addition to the coming of God's kingdom. They are not to consist of and are not to be understood as consisting of asking God to intervene in the causal order so as to bring about various things that we would very much like to happen in addition to the coming of God's kingdom. They are instead to be understood as the church's concrete expression of her longing for the full manifestation of God's kingdom. By concrete expression, I mean that rather than being content with a generalized expression of longing, we name concrete points of longing. May Ruth be healed. May our tyrannical regime be overthrown and so forth. The question whose answer we have been pursuing is what is the understanding of God implicit in the liturgical act of asking God to hear favorably our praise, our thanksgiving, our plea for forgiveness, our supplications? To answer the question, we have to get clear on what exactly it is that we're asking God to do when we ask God to hear favorably our address. The answer to our question is now immediately before us. The understanding of God implicit in our liturgical act of asking God to hear favorably our address to God is that of God is actively engaged in bringing about the full manifestation of God's kingdom. <clears throat> but what is God's kingdom? In the Nicene Creed, recited in the enactment of many traditional liturgies, we declare of Christ that he will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And the prayers of the people within the rite for holy communion of the Episcopal Church, the people pray that with all the saints who have died, they may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. In the alternative form six for the prayers of the people they pray, for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. In right two for Holy Communion, the celebrant includes in the great thanksgiving, the petition that at the last day, God will bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. In that same rite, they pray after communion that they may be heirs of your eternal kingdom. And finally, in right one of the Holy Eucharist, the people pray after communion 
that they may be heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. I could cite counterpart passages from any other of the traditional liturgies. There can be no doubt whatsoever that the understanding of the kingdom of God coming to expression in the creed and in these prayers is a different understanding from that coming to expression in the Lord's Prayer. What the prayers refer to as God's heavenly, eternal, or everlasting kingdom is not the same as the kingdom whose coming is marked, among other things, by the fact that people have sufficient sustenance for their daily lives and are released from the grip of evil. By the kingdom of God, the creed and the prayers mean the age of consummation, the age of the resurrection. And the word eternal strongly suggests that it's understood as a kingdom that lies outside our space and time. The liturgy of the Episcopal Church is not at all peculiar in that this is what it has in mind when it speaks of God's kingdom. It is, on the contrary, typical. So within these liturgies, there is a certain degree of tension. When they speak of God's kingdom, it is typically to the age of resurrection that they are referring. Yet they include among the prayers of the liturgy, the Lord's Prayer, where the reference is clearly to something for whose coming here and now we pray, in this place and time. Of course, the kingdom for whose coming here and now we pray is not wholly disconnected from God's kingdom in the age to come. Insofar as we have bread sufficient for the day, insofar as we are delivered from the grip of evil, insofar as we forgive and are forgiven, we experience a foretaste of that eternal kingdom. Indeed, our enactment of the liturgy itself is a foretaste of that eternal kingdom. So I think it's right that there should be some degree of tension on this point within the liturgy. What's not right, I think, is that references in the liturgy to God's eternal kingdom should come so close to overwhelming references to the coming of God's kingdom in this present age. So where shall we look for an articulation or elaboration of the understanding of God's kingdom being employed in the Lord's Prayer? And presupposed by the plea, so I've argued, scattered throughout the liturgy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Um, not, I suggest, to the speculative ruminations concerning the kingdom of God by one or another systematic theologian, sorry, systematic theologian, but to whatever sources will illuminate for us what Jesus had in mind. Fortunately, we now have available to us a guide to and through those sources that is, in my judgment, without peer. Though I hasten to add that that judgment comes from someone who has no experience in the field, no expertise in the field whatsoever. The guide I have in mind is the extraordinarily comprehensive, thorough, perceptive, and balanced discussion by N.T. Wright in his 1996 publication, Jesus and the Victory of God and his recent publication, 2012, a popular presentation of the same material that he calls How God Became King. Every other discussion of the kingdom of God that I've read seems to me thin, pallid, and misleading in comparison. Wright's discussion displays thorough acquaintance with the relevant original texts and nothing short of massive acquaintance with the secondary literature. And I find it refreshingly, refreshingly clear of glib enlightenment and post-enlightenment skepticism. The books are lengthy. Jesus and the Victory of God has 662 pages of text. How God Became King has 276. Here I can do no more than present the heart of the matter. A good deal of my presentation will consist of quotations, but I won't bother over and over to tell you exactly when I'm quoting. Near the opening of his discussion on how God became king, the relatively brief later book, Wright observes that the great creeds, when they refer to Jesus, pass directly from his virgin birth to his suffering and death. The four gospels don't. Or to put it the other way around, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all seem to think it's hugely important that they tell us a great deal about what Jesus did between the time of his birth and the time of his death. 
In particular, they tell us about what we might call his kingdom inaugurating work. The deeds and words that declared that God's kingdom was coming then and there, in some sense or other, on earth as in heaven. They tell a great deal about that, but the great creeds don't. That was a quotation from them. N.T. Wright. Wright quotes the section of the Apostles' Creed about Jesus Christ. And then Riley observes, so much detail, and yet nothing at all about what Jesus did in between being conceived and born on the one hand, and being crucified under Pontius Pilate on the other. What is the true of the creeds is true as well of many of the prayers in the liturgy. The great thanksgiving in the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer goes straight from the Incarnation to the Crucifixion. Now the reason for this striking gap in the creeds is, of course, that the creeds were the outcome of intense and extended controversies in the early church over the nature of Incarnation and Trinity. Nothing that Jesus was reported as having done or said between his birth and his death proved particularly controversial in the early centuries of the church. Hence, no need to mention the central substance of the Gospels in the creeds. Wright observes that this, however, has had a massive, albeit completely unintended, consequence. It is, he says, one of the major reasons why Christians to this day find it so hard to grasp what the Gospels are really trying to say. From Wright's discussion, it becomes clear that there's another, I rather think even more weighty reason, why we find it so hard to grasp what the Gospels are trying to say about the kingdom inaugurating words and works of Jesus. Wright argues compellingly that the old picture of Jesus as the teacher of timeless truths, or the announcer of the essentially timeless call for decision, will simply have to go. To understand what the Gospels were trying to say, he argues, we have to enter the thought world of first century Jews. What the Gospels were trying to say about the kingdom inaugurating words and works of Jesus was a variation on that thought world. But let's face it, to us, members of early 21st century Western societies, that thought world is profoundly strange. Somewhat less strange to those of us who are Christians than it is to our secular neighbors. Yet to us too it is strange, weird, hard to get into, miles away from how we customarily think. So let's get into this weird thought world. The gospel says right, suggests that Jesus was seen at, as and saw himself as a prophet. A prophet like the prophets of old, coming to Israel with a word from her covenant God, warning her of the imminent and fearful consequences of the direction she was traveling, urging and summoning her to a new and different way, and grouping around himself a company who would be regarded as the true people of Yahweh. He traveled from village to village, with an entourage of 12 disciples, proclaiming the Im imminent coming of the kingdom of God. His proclamation took the form of parables, judgments of doom, and sayings, often cryptic. It took the form of actions symbolic of the coming of the kingdom, such as the entrance into Jerusalem, the cleansing of the temple, the Last Supper. And it took the form of actions that bestowed shalom, and were thus indicative of the breaking in of the kingdom such as healings, exorcisms, declarations of forgiveness, and meals with religious and social outcasts. Now the impression many of us, probably most of us, maybe all of us get from the Gospels, is that the parables, the judgments of doom, the sayings, and so forth, were each delivered once. And biblical critics then busily try to explain why the reports of what Jesus said vary somewhat from gospel to gospel. Wright argues that this impression surely has to be mistaken. In traveling from village to village, Jesus would have performed healings and exorcisms in many villages, would have had meals with outcasts in many houses, would have delivered roughly the same saying many times, told roughly the same parables, issued the same judgments of doom. No doubt with slight variations, 
So what each of the Gospels give us is, as it were, a composite picture in which the most memorable incidents are highlighted. Let me quote right. Within the peasant oral culture of his day, Jesus must have left behind him not one or two isolated traditions, but a veritable mare's nest of anecdotes and also of sentences, aphorisms, rhythmic sayings, memorable stories with local variations, words that were remembered because of their pithy and apposite phrasing and because of their being instantly repeated by those who had heard them. So what would a Palestinian Jew in the first half of the first century have understood an itinerant prophet to be saying when the prophet declared that the kingdom of God was about to arrive? Or to put the same question in other words, what would he or she have understood a prophet to be saying when the prophet declared that God was about to become king? There was no mystery in how they would have understood the claim that some human being was about to become king. But how would they have understood the claim that God would shortly become king? That the kingdom of God was at hand. As Wright Riley observes, they would not have understood it as the claim that the space-time universe was about to come to an end, or that a transcendent figure was about to come floating cloud-borne toward Earth. They would have understood it as the claim that Israel's great hope was about to be realized within history, that this present evil age was about to end. And that hope was intertwined with their memory of what Yahweh had done in the past and with their analysis of her present situation. Israel remembered its deliverance from, by Yahweh from slave labor in Egypt and its entrance into the promised land. It remembered the founding of the Davidic monarchy. And it remembered the first temple built by Solomon, where Yahweh had chosen to dwell. The Psalms, which formed the staple diet of Jew Jewish worship during the time of the first temple, continually celebrated the fact that Israel's God was Lord of the whole earth, and that he had chosen to dwell in the temple in Jerusalem, whence he would hear his people's prayers and come to their aid. The temple, in being Yahweh's dwelling place, was the spot where heaven and earth met. The destruction of the, given those views, the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians, the end of Israel's self-rule, and its forced exile from the land, were catastrophes of unspeakable dimensions. It could only be explained in terms of Yahweh's abandonment of Israel. The glory of Yahweh, the Shekinah, had departed from the temple. The Davidic monarchy had been cast aside. And rather than protecting Israel from its enemies, Yahweh had delivered Israel into the hands of its enemies, who then proceeded to exile her from the land of promise. A remnant had returned from Babylon to live in the land of promise, and the temple had been rebuilt, but Israel's longing was not yet requited. Its return from exile was incomplete because it remained subject to a foreign power. The Davidic monarchy had not been restored, and its enemies remained as powerful and menacing as ever. And Yahweh had not returned to Zion to deal with evil, to right wrongs, to bring justice to those who were thirsting for it, like dying people in a desert. Israel's identity in its condition of quasi-exile was then thought to, by many, to depend on faithfully keeping Torah. Let me now quote Wright. If, in that situation, someone were to speak to Jesus' contemporaries of Yahweh's becoming king, we may, say, may safely assume that they would have had in mind, in some form or other, this two-sided story concerning the double reality of exile. Namely, Israel would really return from exile, and Yahweh would finally return to Zion. But if those two were to happen, Israel's return and Yahweh's return, there would have to be a third element as well. Evil, usually in the form of Israel's enemies, would have to be defeated. <laughs> 
Together, this is still right, together these three themes form the meta-narrative implicit in the language of the kingdom. It cannot be stressed too strongly that the kingdom of God as a theme within Second Temple Judaism connoted first and foremost this triple storyline. What I've presented so far is Wright's exposition, stripped of its 750 pages of rich details, of what a Jew in the village in the first half of the first century would have thought had a prophet come through town proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God. He would have thought that the prophet was predicting the coming vindication of Israel, victory over the pagans, and the eventual gift of justice, peace, and prosperity. But had he listened with any care to this particular prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, he would have discerned that there was much that was strange and unexpected about what this prophet was saying. There were other people coming through the village offering programs of liberation and renewal for Israel. Some urged arm resistance to the Romans. Some urged top to bottom reformation of the temple cult. Quite a few urged more scrupulous obs observance of the Torah. But this prophet pronounced judgment on nationalist programs of arm resistance to Rome and declared that the day of the temple cult and of Torah observance were over. He did proclaim the end of Israel's exile, but he was working with a different understanding of exile, and thus with a different understanding of how exile ends. He was proclaiming vindication of Israel and victory over her enemies, but he was working with a different understanding of vindication and of victory. He was proclaiming the return of Yahweh to Israel, but he was working with a different understanding of Yahweh's presence. In short, Jesus was employing Israel's traditional self-understanding in such a way as to subvert it. Let me again quote Wright. Jesus was announcing that the long-awaited kingdom of Israel's God was indeed coming to birth, but that it didn't look like what had been imagined. The return from exile, the defeat of evil, and the return of Yahweh to Zion were all coming about, but not in the way Yahweh had, uh, Israel had supposed. A time of restoration was at hand, and people of all sorts were summoned to share and enjoy it. But Israel was warned that her present ways of going about advancing the kingdom were thoroughly counterproductive and would result in an enormous national disaster. Not only was Jesus announcing that the story of Israel was now coming to its decisive climax, albeit in unexpected ways, he indicated that it was coming to its decisive climax in his own words and works. He believed that it was own, his own task, not only to announce, but to enact and embody the three major kingdom themes, namely the return from exile, the defeat of evil, and the return of Yahweh, of Yahweh to Zion. In short, he saw himself not just as one prophet among many, but as the prophet through whose work Israel's history would finally reach its climactic moment. His beliefs were those of a first century Jew who believed that the kingdom was coming in and through his own work. His loyalty to Israel's cherished beliefs, therefore, took the form of critique and renovation from within, of challenge to traditions and institutions whose true purpose, he believed, had been grievously corrupted and distorted, and of new proposals which, though without precedent, were never mere innovation. All too briefly, then, what was Jesus saying, and what did he see himself as doing? As their opening summary of Jesus' proclamation, both Matthew and Mark report Jesus as saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In thus connecting the coming of the kingdom with repentance, Jesus was saying nothing new. Every faithful Jew of the time believed that it was because of her disobedience that God had allowed Israel's exile, and that a once for all national repentance would be necessary for the exile to end at last, and for Yahweh once again to dwell with his people. What was new 
in Jesus' call for repentance was not the call as such, but his message as to the fundamental sins of which Israel had to repent. <clears throat> Israel had to repent of her idolatrous, idolatrous nationalism. Israel was being led to ruin by her zealous defense and practice of those aspects of Torah which marked out Israel over against her pagan neighbors. The temple cult, the observance of Sabbaths, of food taboos, of circumcision. Instead of being a light to the nations as she was called to be, Israel was using temple and Torah as a defense against Gentiles, and hence as a reinforcement of national boundaries and aspirations. It was time, Jesus said, to relativize those God-given markers of Israel's distinctiveness. And as to the temple itself, which was the central symbol of the whole national life, it was under divine threat. And unless Israel repented, it would fall to the pagans. The temple had become a den of brigands, and the temple cult so horribly compromised that the only solution was for it to be destroyed. It had become hopelessly corrupt, as ripe for judgment as in the days of Jeremiah. Israel also had to repent of its long tradition of holy war and its tendency to resort to armed violence in defense of the nation. Israel's challenge to Israel, uh, Jesus' challenge to Israel was aimed precisely at telling Israel to repent of her militaristic nationalism, her aspirations for national liberation from Rome, to be won through a great actual battle were the, themselves a telltale symbol of her basic disease and had to be rooted out. Jesus was offering a different way of liberation, a way which affirmed the humanness of the national enemy as well as the destiny of Israel, and hence also affirmed the destiny of Israel as the bringer of light to the world, not as one who would crush the world with military zeal. In parables and sayings, Jesus consistently and continually warned his contemporaries that unless Israel repented in these ways, it has gave up military confrontation with Rome and followed his radical alternative vision of the kingdom. Unless Israel did that, her time was up. Wrath would come upon her in the form not so much of fire and brimstone from heaven as of Romans and Roman swords and falling brickwork. Indeed, so prominent in his prophetic ministry was Jesus' prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple unless Israel changed her ways, that his reputation as a prophet was staked on his prediction of the temple's fall within a generation. If the temple remained forever and his movement fizzled out, he would have been shown to have been a charlatan, a false prophet, worse, a blasphemer. But if the temple was to be destroyed and the sacrifices stopped, if the pagan hordes were to tear it down stone by stone, and if his followers were to escape from the conflagration unharmed, in a reenactment of Israel's escape from their exile and doomed Babylon, why then he would have been vindicated, not only as a prophet, but as Israel's representative. If Jerusalem is destroyed and Jesus' people escape from the ruin just in time, that will be Yahweh becoming king, bringing about the liberation of his true covenant people the true return from exile, the beginning of the new world order. So Israel's true exile lay not in the fact that, though living in the land of promise, she remained subject to a former foreign power. Her true exile lay in the fact that her way of life alienated her from God. Return from that exile required the repentance of rooting out her idolatrous nationalism and her tendency toward violence and living an entirely new way of life a new praxis, love of the neighbor, whoever the neighbor may be, even if the neighbor is an enemy, offering forgiveness rather than seeking vengeance, pursuing justice for the poor, the downtrodden, and the vulnerable, sharing meals with the religious and social outcasts, showing no partiality. The call to repentance was a political call summoning Israel as a nation to abandon one set of agendas and embrace another.
must not be overlooked that repentance for Jesus did not involve going to the temple and offer, offering sacrifice. The day of the temple cult and its sacrifices was over, he said. His summons was truly radical. It had nothing to do with urging people to visit the temple more often, to offer more sacrifices, to take more care over ritual purification. His implied narrative continued, not with national restoration per se, but with the challenge to his band of hearers to follow a different way of being Israel and to await a different sort of vindication. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark reports Jesus is saying. Repent and believe in the gospel. Faith was a central component of the new way of being Israel that Jesus was urging. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus himself. The faith which is the concomitant of so many of Jesus' acts of healing is not simply believing that Israel's God can do this. It is believing that Israel's God is acting climactically in the career of Jesus himself. Both halves of this, says Wright, are important. This is the moment Israel has been expecting, and this moment is constituted and characterized precisely by the presence and activity of Jesus. And just as Jesus was not merely announcing the coming of the kingdom and bringing it about, so also those of his followers who followed his summons were not just practicing a different way of being Israel, but were the true Israel. In their repentance, Israel's alienation from God or exile was ending. I quote, the basic story Jesus was telling invited his hearers to see themselves as the true Israel returning at last from exile and turning back to their God as an essential part of the process. Jesus was summoning his hearers to be Israel in a new way, to take up their roles in the unfolding drama. And he assured them that if they followed him in this way, they would be vindicated when the great day of trial came. In the course of all this, he was launching a decisive battle with the real satanic enemy, a different battle and a different enemy from the Rome that Israel envisaged. Israel indeed had to repent of her exclusive nationalism and of the vengeful violence that so often went along with it. But neither of these was the root of the problem. Jesus' analysis of the plight of Israel went beyond the specifics of behavior and belief to what he saw as the root of the problem. The Israel of his day had been duped by the accuser, Satan, Satan. That which was wrong with the rest of the world was wrong with Israel too. Evil could not be located conveniently beyond Israel's borders and the pagan hordes. It had taken up residence within the chosen people. The battle against evil, the correct analysis of the problem and the correct answer to it, was therefore of a different order from that imagined by his contemporaries. Throughout his career, Jesus had seen himself as in combat with a strange evil force that haunted the world. That was the significance of the exorcisms, of the healings, of many of the controversies. The healings and the exorcisms were dramatic signs of victory over that evil force, signs of the coming of the kingdom and the restoration of creation. Jesus then went to Jerusalem in order to engage the strange evil force, which he had been combating throughout his career in the final and decisive battle realizing that this final stage in the battle would involve suffering. For suffering was itself a key ingredient within the Jewish expectation of the great deliverance. And how would the evil one be defeated? It would be defeated not by military victory, but by a doubly revolutionary method, turning the other cheek, going the second mile, taking up the cross, the agenda which Jesus mapped out for his followers was the agenda to which he himself was obedient. This was how the kingdom would come, how the battle would be won. All through his public career, he had acted on the basis of compassion for the multitudes, for the poor, for the sheep without a shepherd. The earliest Christians regarded Jesus' achievement on the cross as the decisive victory over evil. But they saw it even more as a climax of a career in which active out going healing love had become the trademark and hallmark. That's right on the coming, Tom Wright on the coming of the kingdom, perhaps too extensive, I don't know. But he's a very vivid writer. <clears throat>
you and I live after the two great events in which Jesus and his proclamation were vindicated, namely the resurrection of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Those two events, especially the former, led the early church to see itself as living in the new age that Jesus had predicted and brought about. In this new age, they did not abandon the idea of the kingdom of God as outdated, nor did they use language about the kingdom of God to refer to something totally different from what Jesus meant. Instead, instead Wright suggests, they reworked the idea so that it would fit their new existential situation. The symbolic world of first century Judaism was rethought from top to bottom, even while its underlying theology of monotheism, election, eschatology, and so forth, was explicitly retained. Wright highlights two elements in the reworking. First, early Christian kingdom language, as we find it in the epistolary literature of the New Testament and in the book of Acts, has little or nothing to do with the vindication of ethnic Israel. The overthrow of Roman rule in Palestine, the building of a new temple on Mount Zion, the establishment of Torah observance, or of the nations flocking to Mount Zion to be judged and or to be educated in the knowledge of Yahweh. The story of the new movement is told without reference, still told in the terms of the kingdom of God, but without reference to the national, racial, racial or geographical liberation of Israel. The regular Jewish symbols have gone completely missing. And the praxis of the kingdom is defined without reference to Torah. The writers don't speak of Israel and her national hope, but instead of a redeemed humanity and cosmos. They see themselves as living at the time when the covenant purpose of the creator, which always envisaged the redemption of the whole world, has moved beyond the narrow confines of a single race for which national symbols had been, of course, appropriate, and called into being a transnational and transcultural community. Further, they see themselves as living at the time when the Creator, the covenant God himself, has returned to dwell with his people, but not in a temple made with hands. So reworking, which deletes the explicitly ethnic Jewish references, Secondly, the kingdom is now referred to as belonging not only to the true God, but to Jesus, the Messiah. And in an important Pauline passage, this joint kingdom of the creator God and of the Messiah is described in chronological terms. The Messiah must reign, says Paul, until he has put all enemies under his feet. Death is the last great enemy to be destroyed. Then comes the end when the Messiah hands over the kingdom to the God who is the Father, when he shall have oppressed all rule and all authority and power. Paul's point is right, is that the creator God is completing through the Messiah the purpose for which the covenant was instituted, namely dealing with sin and death, and is thereby restoring creation under the wise rule of the renewed human being. The vital difference between this view and those we find in non-Christian Second Temple literature, is that the kingdom is, in a sense, already present, as well as, in another sense, still future. The kingdom of the Messiah is already established, while the kingdom of God, in this stricter sense, is yet to come. We see here exactly that tension between present realization and future hope, which is so utterly characteristic of early Christianity as a whole, and so puzzlingly opaque to generations of modern scholars. What we find across the board in early Christianity is a firm belief in the presentness of the kingdom, alongside an equally firm belief in its futurity. These two positions held together in a refined apocalyptic scheme. The point of the present kingdom is that it is the first fruits of the future kingdom. And the future kingdom involves the abolition, not of space and time, or the cosmos itself, but rather of that which threatens space, time, and creation, namely sin and death. So finally, back to where we began. The question I posed was, what are we asking God to do 
when we ask God to hear favorably our address to him? How are we to understand this liturgical act? I suggested that all our petitions should be understood as having, as their overarching context, our prayer for the coming of God's kingdom. And that led us into an extensive discussion, under the guidance of N.T. Wright, of God's kingdom and its coming. <clears throat> We who are Christians long for the coming of God's kingdom. Our longing does not remain on the level of the general and the abstract. It takes the concrete form of longing that the coming of God's kingdom may take the form of Ruth's healing, the form of the downfall of our tyrannical regime, the form of peace in the Middle East, and so forth. When we ask God to accept our prayers, we are asking God to accept our concrete longing for the coming of God's kingdom. Of course, if we in our daily lives are not playing our own role in the coming of God's kingdom, if we are not promoting the hallowing of God's name in our community, if we are not promoting the doing of God's will in our nation, if we are not working to the end that everybody has sustenance adequate for his or her daily life, if we are not promoting release from the grip of one and another ism, then our prayer is malformed, defective. That's the point of the prophetic critique of inauthentic worship. Can we say that we call to God's attention the ways in which our world falls short of the full manifestation of his kingdom? Can we say that what we are doing in our prayers is reminding God of these shortfalls? Yes, I think we can. Provided that we understand ourselves in so doing as using our terms remind and call to his attention with analogical extension. Suppose that in the context of declaring that the kingdom is God's and praying for the coming of the kingdom, we then name Ruth's disease name our tyrannical regime, name conflict in the Middle East as indications of the kingdoms not yet having fully come, and pray that the coming of the kingdom may take the form of Ruth being healed, the regime being overthrown, conflict ending. If Ruth is healed, if the tyrannical regime is overthrown, if peace does come to the Middle East, we then receive these as signs of the coming of the kingdom, and we give God thanks and praise. But suppose that Ruth is not healed, that our regime is not overthrown, that peace does not come to the Middle East. How do we interpret that? Do we interpret that as God not, as God not having heard favorably our prayer for the coming of his kingdom? we do not. We know that the coming of God's kingdom is slow, painfully slow, for reasons we do not grasp. It takes time. The fact that sickness, oppression, and conflict remain is not for us a sign that God's kingdom is not a coming. What we acknowledge is that our longing that Ruth be healed as a sign of the coming of the kingdom has not been fulfilled that our longing that the regime be overthrown as a sign of the coming of the kingdom has not been fulfilled, that our longing that there be peace in the Middle East as a sign of the coming of the kingdom has not been fulfilled. Living with unfulfilled longings of these sorts is intrinsic to the Christian life in this present age. God desires such longings. Not only should our petition that God hear favorably our plea for forgiveness and our intercessions be set within the frame of longing for the coming of God's kingdom, our prayer that God accept our praise and thanksgiving should likewise be set and understood within that frame. Praise and thanksgiving are themselves signs of the kingdom. To close, the liturgical theological question before us in this lecture has been, what is the understanding of God implicit in our liturgical acts of asking God to hear favorably our praise and thanksgiving, our plea for forgiveness, our supplications?
The answer is now obvious. We understand God, unsurpassable in glory, holiness, and love, as engaged in bringing about the full manifestation of God's kingdom. What we do in our daily lives, in what we do in our daily lives, and in our enactment of the liturgy, we align ourselves with God's bringing about of his kingdom. In our prayer, that God hear favorably what we say, we give voice to our longing for the coming of God's kingdom. Thank you.